the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the church which will not endure sound doctrine having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Winston Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the Apostate Church of the Book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called The Pace of Ecumenical Process and deals, as you probably already know and can see by the name of the chapter of the <laughs> of the video it deals with chapter 7 of the book all roads lead to rome by michael de Semlian, which is all about the ecumenical movement and this is called the pace of ecumenical progress there are so many things that i think about when reading this book that i don't understand in the light of the Bible. And I probably will do here and there a little comment on that while I'm going along reading this chapter 17. But the only thing that I want to say right for the moment at this second is that I do not understand anybody who is taking part in this ecumenical process and who calls himself a protestant when a protestant is also defined as being someone who holds up the bible and the bible only sola scriptura the whole ecumenical movement as we have learned so far and as we will surely learn reading this chapter 17 of the book is nothing else but compromise compromise traditions but okay let's not go too far away here and let's see where we end reading chapter 17 the pace of ecumenical progress on page 177 if you follow in your copy of your own book if the alarmists have it right time is short with the eyes of the Church of England on the very emotive but essentially secondary issue of the ordination of women, in the 1988 Lambeth Conference voted almost anonymously to confirm the Swanwick Declaration of the previous year and to abandon the Reformation and its solid foundations of faith. Yeah, what did I just say in the, uh, in the beginning of this video? to abandon the Reformation and its solid foundations of faith. That's what the whole book actually, what the whole ecumenical movement actually is all about. Abandon the Reformation and its solid foundations of faith. The ecumenical movement is led by the Jesuit order. 
the Roman papal order that was ordained by Pope Paul III in 1540 under the name Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, a military order under the directive of a general, the superior general of the order. And that was formed to counter reformation, to counter the reformation. So, and we read here, to abandon the reformation and its solid foundations of faith. Exactly. That's what's it all about. Now, 1988, with all its anniversaries, well, the anniversaries of 1588 and the anniversaries of 1688, remind you, reminding us of our great biblical heritage and of God's grace in preserving the nation from the tyranny of false religion, may well prove ironically to have been the year of decision for Protestantism and the Reformation in England. Steps toward union of the Anglican and Roman churches would follow very quickly now, although with such a wholehearted consensus among Anglican leaders, the Vatican is understandably, quote-unquote, playing hard to get and looking for a final agreement closer to its unchanging view. The unchanging view of Rome. Rome never changes. Agreement at the top cannot proceed faster than the consensus at the grassroots. Archbishop Runcie's equations to the concept of papal supremacy and the enthusiastic announcement in Rome in September 1989 of the quote-unquote engagement of the two churches with an intent to marriage brought a shocked reaction from many in both church and nation. There needs to be a pause at the national level. So Archbishop Runchy announced a engagement between the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And an engagement is a promise to marry, right? There at least it sent some shocks, uh, some shock reactions, well, from the Anglican Church and from the nation. That's in 1989. And what is it today? Are there still shocks being sent through the Church and through the nation? Well, there is no such pause at the local level. There, with the interchurch process and the decade of evangelism in full swing, the pace of ecumenical progress is breathtaking. Local covenants are being pledged and even signed all over the country with the Roman Catholic Church. Such covenants are contrary to the strong warning of Scripture. Quote, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Unquote. James chapter 5, verse 12. A major instance was the signing of the covenant for the coalition of, on revival in Washington, D.C., in July 1986. The commitment to unity signed by such as Bob Mumford, John Wimber and Reconstru Reconstructionists, Gary North and R.J. Rushdooney provides for a non-quarreling policy regarding doctrine and declared principles of church leaders and thousands of congregations across America. A similar non-quarreling policy guide is provided on, uh, for the major conferences of the International Charismatic Consultation on World Evangelization, including Brighton 91. In towns like Coventry, Winchester and Guildford, Churches Together has united the great majority of the nation's churches for ecumenical covenants, special events, exchanges of preachers, services of mutual commitment, ecumenical missions and various youth activities. The sharing of churches by Anglicans and Roman Catholics, which has been going on for a number of years, has been given fresh impetus by the interchurch process. Respected Christian organizations, such as 
Scripture Union and United Bible Society have linked their names with the ecumenical instrument and involved themselves in ecumenical mission with a decade of evangelism and the decade of evangelization. Now, can I ask a question here to my dear listeners? Respected Christian organizations such as Scripture Union and United Bible Society have linked their names with ecumenical instrument with the ecumenical instrument and involved themselves in ecumenical mission within the decade of evangelism and decade of evangelization. So what's my question? When those are so-called quote-unquote respected Christian organizations like Scripture Union and United Bible Society, how can these organizations be partakers of a movement to reunite the Protestants with the Church of Rome? when they are anything holding on to their name. United Bible Society and Scripture Union, what is one of the most important creeds of Protestantism? Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. And these organizations call themselves Scripture Union and United Bible Society, and they link their names with ecumenical uh, with the ecumenical instrument. How true are they to their name? How true are they to Scripture? That's a question I have to ask. Now, you have to understand when you read a book like this that, that deals all the time with the ecumenical movement, that deals all the time with nothing else but to reunite the so-called, as they say from Vatican II on, separated brethren, which used to be heretics, to reunite those with the so-called mother church, the universal church, the Roman Catholic church, the only church out of, out of which there is no other salvation in the world, as the Pope says. When we all go back to Rome, where does that leave the Bible? When the Roman Catholic Church actually says that her gospel is not the Bible alone, but the Bible and tradition. And tradition is what man made. It's not something that God made. So my question is, how can anybody who calls himself a Protestant and acts under the credo, under the creed of Sola Scriptura, be a part of an organization calls itself Scripture Union and United Bible Society when these societies are crawling back to Rome? Something I just don't get. And where have we ever read in this book anything about that these organizations, not only the two I mentioned right now, but all this interfaith movement, interchurch movement, all these movements coming together, these evangelization agendas and everything else, where are they ever citing the Bible? Where's the Bible in all this? Where's the word of God in all this? That is something that sickens me. It sickens me that people who call themselves Protestants are working for an agenda and not taking into consideration, even for once, the Word of God. The Word of God is never discussed. The Bible is never discussed. It's only about differences between men, differences between organizations, but never talking about the Word of God and how that fits it in, in all together. You see, as the author continues here, interchurch marriages, raised, 
inter-church marriages, rare occurrences until 20 years ago, so that means until the 1970s, and often featuring prominent Roman Catholics have led to the forming of ecumenical groups and speeded up the ecumenical process. Again, what does the Bible say about those things? Inter-church communities are sharing monastic life, retreats and spiritual disciplines together. Pilgrimages to well-publicized ecumenical communities like Thais and France gain recognition in all quarters of the church. What does the Bible say about pilgrimages? Traveling to places of dead people. Venerating the dead. What does the Bible say about that? Now this is very interesting. Milton Keynes, which styles itself, quote, the UK's first ecumenical city, unquote, appointed the nation's first ecumenical moderator on January 1st, 1991. Baptist minister Hugh Cross, previously ecumenical officer for England, became an ecumenical bishop in all but name. The first ecumenical city built the first ecumenical church. Christ the Cornerstone, it is called. It is a three million pound doomed edifice of cathedral proportions, which was dedicated by Her Majesty the Queen on March 13th, 1992. Quote, May this church in Milton Keynes be a pledge of our common commitment, a signpost to an increasingly shared future and a beacon of hope for the whole community, said Roman Catholic Primate Cardinal Hume at the service of dedication. End quote. This would simply never have occurred to previous generations and demonstrates how far we are now committed to the work of Christian unity. Unquote. The sermon preached to the Queen by a cardinal was another religious landmark, and again in breach of the sovereign's accession oath, you know, the royal declaration, the first sermon preached by a Roman Catholic to a reigning monarch since the 17th century, since the glorious revolution of 1688, which was like the Spanish Armada in 1588, one of the reasons that the book started with 1988 and all its anniversaries reminding us of our great biblical heritage. 1988, 200 years of the glorious revolution of 1688, or 300 years, sorry, and 400 years of 1588 of the Spanish Armada attack. That God intervened and made fail by his intervention. This sermon preached to the Queen by the Cardinal was another religious landmark, the first sermon preached by a Roman Catholic to a reigning monarch since the 17th century. So when there is a Roman Catholic priest, in this case a bishop, or cardinal, sorry, cardinal, even worse. <laughs> when there's a Roman Catholic cardinal preaching a sermon to the so-called Protestant Queen of England, how Protestant are they really? Remember that from the Royal Declaration you are missing the words mental reservation as I read to you from the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia. Go back to that reading if you don't understand. Anyway, the next part of the chapter is called Semper Eadem, or a new ecumenical flexibility. Semper Eadem stands for never changing. With such a cooperation and commitment being brought to bear, it is instructive to re-examine the basis for the new togetherness 
and its heady prospects of bringing the gospel to all nations. A new togetherness. Yeah. Enthusiastic ecumenists may not all be aware of Cardinal Bia's definitive statement at Zurich in 1962. Quote, no concessions in dogma can be made by the Church of Rome for the sake of Christian unity. But pronouncements in many other areas, as the forthcoming Ecumenical Council Vatican II should make efforts towards unity easier. Unquote. I'm going to read this once again, that you understand it very well. Cardinal Beer of the Roman Catholic Church states in 1962 no concessions in dogma can be made by the church for the sake of Christian unity. What does that tell you? That tells you that Rome never changes. It always asks change from the others. This is a confirmation of everything we've read so far, everything I've ever said on Hour of the Truth, everything I ever said in all my other broadcasts. Rome never changes. No concessions in dogma can be made by the Church for the sake of Christian unity. So the only one who has to make concessions in dogma are the Protestants. And what is that? Well, the problem that I addressed earlier in this reading, giving up the Bible as their standard, giving up the Bible as their conscience, giving up the Word of God as their conscience. Freedom of conscience is what the Pope absolutely does not agree with, because he is the conscience of everyone. He is to judge every man and not to be judged by any man. That is Roman Catholic dogma, and Cardinal Bia says, no concessions in dogma can be made by the Church for the sake of Christian unity. No, it is black or white. It is not gray for the Roman Catholic Church. So it should be for the Protestants. Black or white, white or black. Jesus or the devil, the truth or the lie, the holy or the profane, and not mixing the one with the other. The Roman Catholic Church stands on absolutes, black and white, because Rome never changes, and that's exactly the same we Protestants should do. Never change. Never give in, never compromise the word of God for the sake of Christian unity. That's what we should do too. Presumably the, in, the pronouncements, the author continues, included among other things the replacement of the term heretic by separated brethren, the new status of the non-Latin mass and the goal of a world more Christian than not. Hmm. Yeah, those are the changes that the Roman Catholic Church did, right? She, she changed the term heretic to separated brethren. She changed the term. Did she change the policy against those people? I don't think so, because the Inquisition is still there, isn't it? It is called the Congregation of the Faith, but it's still there. The new status of the non-Latin Mass. Okay, the Mass is now spoken even in the vulgar language. But the content of what is spoken in the Mass is the same. The Roman Church's pronouncements in many other areas facilitating the new grand strategy of ecumenical unity represent a major departure from the historic rigidities of the faith. This unprecedented flexibility in matters of faith and practice signals the determination of the Vatican to follow through on the strategy. 
For example, recruitment to the priesthood has been a problem in recent years. Yeah, I guess so. One reason, certainly, is that in a world of so many diversions and so, many temptation, so much temptation, those who sincerely opt for celibacy are far less in evidence. Certainly there are increasing numbers of priests leaving the ministry in order to get married. In recognition of this, the Vatican has set in motion what has been termed, quote, a quiet revolution, unquote. Married priests, mainly former Anglicans, have been ordained and permitted to take Mass, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States of America, with the approval of the Pope. Quote, Pastoral provision, unquote, has been established by which they could enter the Church, and the validity of Anglican orders has not proved to be an obstacle. There are now married parish priests and curates working in parishes. Here we see the actual outworking of the policy of facing both ways at the same time. Like the god Janus, a two-faced god, eh? The official line is that the Pope still holds rigorously to a rule of celibacy for his ministers and married priests will only be used in quote-unquote unique situations and as quote-unquote individual concessions, which have quote no relevance to the broader debate within the Catholic Church. Unquote. And I tell you, those liberal movements are the first to be persecuted by Rome when she has the upper hand, as always. Another answer to what is, recognized, uh, to what is a recognized problem of dwindling numbers may have been found to the, uh, for the closing years of the millennium in the decade of evangelization and a new post-synodal apostolic exhortation of the Pope. Quote, Dearth of priests means birth of laity, unquote, and green light for laity were two of the leader items in the Catholic Herald on th uh, of 3rd of February 1989. The editorial describes the Pope's apostolic exhortation. Released that week, Christi Fidelis Laici means the lay members of Christ's faithful as, quote, uniting as Never before the efforts of clergy and laity in sanctifying the world. Unquote. Evangelization 2000, which focuses the enthusiasm and drive of large numbers of committed Catholic laity, undoubtedly will help to resolve the problem. Now, the next part we come to is called the ordination of women. Because, you know, like we just read, the Roman Catholic Church has a problem of getting enough priests. So, first they tone down and give another direction to the celibacy and that former Anglican pastors, I call them, to make a distinction with Roman Catholic priests, that former Anglican pastors who have been married and converted to Catholicism can stay married and actually fulfill the office of a Roman Catholic priest. Of a Roman Catholic priest. So that's one way, as we just read. The next way is the ordination of women. Which actually should not be so surprising, because we know that Rome has its roots in Babylon. And in Babylon there was Semiramis, who was a high priestess. Just something to put in the back of your mind while we're reading about the ordination of women here. Without question, the decision in November 1992 of the Church of England's Synod to ordain women priests appears to present an insuperable obstacle to Anglican unity with Rome. Yet, with the rapidly changing attitudes in the world, this issue, already dividing Catholics, could well become subject to the new ecumenical flexibility that has evolved out of Vatican II. 
how well entrenched in church dogma will it prove to be? The recent tolerance displayed towards celibacy and married priests perhaps points the way to a major change in the not too distant future. We go to a little footnote here, that in the United States a major policy statement prepared for Catholic bishops affirming Roman Catholic policy on women's issues was given only 55.5% support, well short of the two-thirds needed for approval. The upshot is that the U.S. bishops have made women's ordination subject to continuing debate, as you can read in Time magazine on 30th of November 1992. The upshot is that U.S. bishops have made women's ordination subject to continuing debate. So, they will see if there is any way to compromise, right? Now, in fact, there are precedents for women priests within the Roman Catholic tradition. Uh, yeah? In pre-Reformation times, both St. Bridget of Kildare and Theodora of Smyrna were priests, and both actually performed the role of a bishop. And not to forget the Pope that was a woman, as I read to you in Babylon mystery religion. You can look that up for yourself. There once was a Pope who was a woman. Yep. Look it up for yourself. It's quite interesting. Now, Cardinal Feig, the late primate of all Ireland, observed in January 1989 that, quote, he would not be surprised if at some future stage the Roman Church had woman priests. I must admit that if Rome decided in the morning that women were to be admitted to the priesthood, it wouldn't cause me the slightest difficulty. Unquote. From the Catholic Herald publication, 3rd of February, 1989. This cardinal says it would not cause him the slightest difficulty. Certainly the Roman Catholic Church has need of more priests. However, many Anglican traditionalists, traditionalists, having lost their battle against woman priests within the Church of England, under the banner of cost of conscience, are organizing themselves to continue the struggle elsewhere. Large numbers of them, led by former Bishop of London Graham Leonard, are looking, in his words, to, quote, approach Rome as suppliants and without presumption, asking if a way could be found somehow to preserve our Anglican identity while being in communion with the See of St. Peter. Unquote. Former Bishop of London of the Anglican Church, Graham Leonard is asking if there is a way to be found somehow to preserve our Anglican identity while being in communion with the See of Peter. What should the answer to that be? Is there a possibility? Only when you change your dogmas. Because Rome doesn't change its dogmas. Bishop Leonard has suggested a papal, quote-unquote, personal prelature, a special privilege granted so far only to Opus Dei. As the traditionalists depart Romeward, the victorious liberals in the Church of England are likely to press ahead with other progressive legislation favoring or at, last, or at least tolerating abortion, sodomy and Probably adultery. I'm going to read this again. As the traditionalists depart Romeward, come back to Mama, the victorious liberals in the Church of England are likely to press ahead with other progressive legislation favoring or at least tolerating abortion, sodomy, and probably adultery. 
Of course, the book does not read sodomy. The book reads homosexuality. LGBT movement today. But I read sodomy. Because the Bible speaks of sodomy and I do not compromise the word of God for a new word of so-called homosexuality. This is a very, very, very important sentence. I hope that you, my listeners, understand this. As the traditionalists depart Romeward, because they are building on tradition, like Rome does, the victorious liberals in the Church of England are likely to press ahead with other progressive legislation, favoring or at least tolerating abortion, sodomy, and probably adultery. Now we are living in 2016, and what do you see in the churches? Tolerating abortion, tolerating sodomy, and probably adultery. I guess the steps have been made in the meantime, between 1992, what we are reading about here, and 2016, when we listen to this book reading. Meanwhile, the Church of Rome, joined by Anglicans who refused to compromise, it seemed to tighten up its moral stance with the new catechism issued in 1992. The Church of England continues to disintegrate as Rome looks to be, uh, uh, as Rome looks to the world ever more like the real Church in this land, England, the United Kingdom. The Church of England continues to disintegrate as Rome looks to the world ever more like the real Church in this land. Of course, it seems that there is more Catholicism in England than there is Protestantism, because the Protestants give up their dogmas. Now, on Papal Premacy, on page 182, the author continues. The other theological issue, which seems to be a roadblock to the reunification of the British Church, is papal primacy. Before Archbishop of Canterbury Robert Runcie visited the Pope in Rome in September 1989, he was quoted as saying, listen quote, closely, quote, Anglicans are beginning to recognize and receive with favor a model of papal supremacy as a blueprint for unity with Roman Catholics. Unquote. Dr. Runcie's statement and the visit was greeted by a skeptical and in part hostile press reaction. However, however, significantly it opened up a national debate about church, crown and constitution in a way never experienced before. The once unmentionable is now open to public discussion. The sacrosanct is no longer sacred. We have now the beginning of a progress of re-education, dealing with the differences and difficulties of reconciling Lambeth and Rome, Protestant and Roman Catholic, papal primacy and the monarchy. Impossibility soon becomes difficulty and irreconcilable. Uh, irreconcilable is reconciled. The radical shift in public opinion over close-to-home moral issues such as sodomy, adultery and abortion, all forbidden in the Bible, illustrates the soft backbone of public opinion. A monarch particularly sympathetic towards Roman Catholicism and an expedient government committed to European federalism would no doubt overcome the remaining difficulties. Now I guess you know why Queen Elizabeth II holds on to her throne this long. Because they need a monarch particularly sympathetic towards Roman Catholicism more than Queen Elizabeth has already been. And I think this is why she still 
reigns in 2016. A monarch particularly sympathetic towards Roman Catholicism and an expedient government committed to European federalism would no doubt overcome the remaining difficulties. Now we've just had the Brexit, the exit of the Britain of the European Union. Is that a step back? I think it uh, only appears that way, but they have an agenda to make it all come back in that way. I don't think that the Brexit is a setback. I think this is just a way that maybe we don't understand that. And therefore you have to read probably a little bit more of Sun Tzu's Art of War to understand why they are doing this. But a monarch particularly sympathetic towards Roman Catholicism is being raised in uh, England right now. And uh, a government committed to European federalism would no doubt overcome the remaining difficulties. Yeah, that's true. But now with the Brexit, this is just the other way around. I think we will see interesting times in that what Great Britain does politically with the European Union in the next few years. Now, according to the front page leader in the Sunday Times of the 21st of January 1990, that newspaper's poll conducted a bare three months later, uh, three months after all the attention given to concerns about papal primacy, showed that nearly half the people in Britain think that the law should be changed to allow the king or queen to be Roman Catholic. Yeah? Is that true? Nearly half the people in Britain think that? Well, that is what they publish in their newspaper. That doesn't have to be that way. They tell you that it is that way. And they say, oh, okay, oh, the majority already agrees that the king or queen could be a Roman Catholic. Oh, the majority thinks that that's all right, eh? Because the majority is always right. Uh, we have to follow the majority. Sunday, according to the front page leader in the Sunday Times of 21st of January 1990, that newspaper's poll conducted about three months after all the attention giving to concerns about papal primacy showed that nearly half the people in Britain think that the law should be change to allow the king or queen to be Roman Catholic. According to the front page leader in the Sunday Times on <laughs> the newspaper's poll. Intermirifica, people. We remember who has the birthright to own all media and to print whatever they want. The Roman Catholic Church. So, does that therefore have to be really a poll taken between really the millions and millions of the English population or is that just a publication they put out there to propagandize a Roman Catholic king or queen in the future? What do you think when you still can think outside of the box, outside of the propaganda, outside of the so-called education, the indoctrination the media puts on us. What do you think? I think they are using every means they have to plant these kind of thoughts in the brains of the people. That's what I think. That does not have to have been a poll where 50% of the people in Britain think that the law should be changed to follow the king or queen to be a Roman Catholic. But when it is printed, the people most of the time believe it. Therefore, it does not have to be that way as long as they print it. Because, you know, when it's written black and white in the newspaper, well, then it has to be true, doesn't it? Newspapers never lie to us, do they? 
Another front page leader in the Sunday Telegraph on the 14th of April 1991 revealed that the Princess of Wales' great 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 uncle Ignatius may become a saint. Such a powerful publicity linking the future queen, which is not going to happen because Diana died already long years ago, linking the future queen with the papacy may have weakened resistance to a Catholic king or queen. Well, they chose another way. They killed Diana. Charles married this abominable madam, some, this, this horse face, um, Parker Bowles, and she was a Roman Catholic, and her father was a Roman Catholic. So they changed the agenda, they, they changed the person, but they didn't change the agenda. Such a powerful publicity. Well, with Charles being with Parker Bowles, who is a Roman Catholic, such powerful publicity linking the future queen, Parker Bowles then in that case, with the papacy, may have weakened resistance to a Catholic king or queen. Whatever will come of that in the future, because I think Charles and Parker Bowles... Uh, um, are, are, are not together anymore. Even. But the point is that that was a Roman Catholic connection in there. Now the chapter ends with Vatican flexibility and the Romanizing process. Vatican flexibility and the Romanizing process. The new post-Vatican II flexibility of practice within the Roman Catholic Church that we have looked at at this chapter and the whole book has also been demonstrated by the accommodation of Anglican rites, including Holy Communion, for defecting American Episcopalians. Encouraged by Rome's accommodating attitude, Disillusioned Anglicans, shocked and hurt by the decision of the Church of England Senate to overturn 2,000 years of tradition with the introduction of women priests and bishops, are defecting to Roman Catholicism all over the world. Such defections are certainly not hindered by the attitude of some of the Church's liberal leaders. Richard Harris, Bishop of Oxford, described a local priest's move to the Roman Catholic Church as, quote, not a defection, but an opportunity to serve in another part of God's family, unquote. As we can read in the Church of England's newspaper, April of 1989. Richard Harris described a local priest's move to the Roman Catholic Church as not a defection but an opportunity to serve in another part of God's family. I wanted to make a little comment already some time ago in this video. I looked over it that you have to check my very first broadcast on Hour of the Truth where I dealt with the Catholic Lutheran Accord in three parts. And the first part of Hour of the Truth was the first part of that. Together with Tom Fress we analyzed a paper that Richard Bennett put together on the Joint Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification. That's because that deals a little bit with what happens after the writing of this book on Reformation Day 1999, so the 31st of October 1999, the Lutheran Worldwide Congregation signed a paper of a joint declaration on the doctrine of justification with the Roman Catholic Church. They were crawling back to Mama. And 2004, five years later, the Methodist Church did the same thing. And what was in this joint declaration of the doctrine of justification, a joint declaration by the Lutherans and the Roman Catholic Church, will be analyzed, or was analyzed, by Tom 
Fresh from Inquisition Update and me, An Hour of the Truth, the Catholic Lutheran Accord, Parts 1, 2 and 3. Please watch this. In the light of the reading of this book, it is absolutely imperative that you understand that. And today, when I'm reading this, is the 23rd of October 2016, so only eight days until we have Reformation Day 2016, which is only one year short of the 500th anniversary of Luther nailing his 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg. Church door at Wittenberg. And then we already have had 18 years of the joint declaration of the doctrine of justification. 18 years before 2017, the 5 months anniversary. 18! 1 plus 8 is not... 18 is that 3 times 6? 6, 6, 6, 6? Do you think that there is maybe a reason why they signed that in 1999 with the Lutherans? Think about it. Anyway, we are dealing here with the ecumenical movement and this book has been published in 1993. So they didn't know, of course, what happened in 1999. That's why I put this up, because there you see another step that the Protestants took into the direction of Rome. And that's why I think that it's so important. I will put a link to the Joint Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification from the Vatican itself into the description box of the video. Open it up for yourself. Read it for yourself. And if you cannot understand it, turn to the videos of Hour of the Truth, where Richard Bennett, a 22 year former priest of the Roman Catholic Church analyzes that paper and tells you what it actually says because it is of course full of casuistry and sophistry but Richard Bennett is aware not only of the casuistry and sophistry in this paper he is also in, in the position to understand the original Latin publication of this paper because all these papers are first published in Latin, because that's the language of the Roman Catholic Church. <coughs> and he can read the Latin, and he can understand the Latin, and he explained it. And that's why he made this paper. And that's why Tom and I analyzed that paper of Richard Bennett to try to tell the people what that joint declaration of the doctrine of justification is actually all about. But, you know, everything that I am reading here in this book actually leads to that joint declaration of the doctrine of justification. Now, 17, next year in 2017, 500 years after that, 18 years before that, 18666. You get the picture? I hope you do. Rome never changes. All of this places, the author continues, the Roman Church in a very, all of this places the Roman Church in a very strong position and with ecumenism growing so strongly at the local level, she is well placed to hurry slowly. <laughs> Isn't that an oxymoron? The accelerating momentum of the ecumenical movement, or what evangelicals in the 19th century called the Romanizing process, oh yeah, they call the spade a spade. It's the process of Romanizing Protestants. That's what's it all about. The ecumenical movement is nothing else but Romanizing Protestantism. Mixing the holy with the profane. Called the Romanizing process is reflected in the changing practices of local churches. The great majority of Church of England churches center their worship around the Eucharist, sometimes still called Holy Communion, rather than on the exposition of the Word of God. What did I say in the beginning? Where is the Word of God in all this? Wherever is the Bible mentioned in all this ecumenical movement? 
Right. The great majority of Church of England churches center their worship around the Eucharist, even though they sometimes still call it Holy Communion, rather than on the exposition of the Word of God. That's what our basis always should be, the Word of God. God. The reserving of the sacrament is widespread in the Church of England, and its adoration is becoming increasingly common among evangelical churches. For example, the village church of Chelfond St. Peter, Buckinghamshire, not thought of in the neighborhood as being high church, has a notice on the church door which reads, listen closely now, listen closely, when you come into this church, remember the Lord Jesus Christ is here. He is present and to be adored under the form of the blessed sacrament reserved for Holy Communion. Kneel down and worship him. Unquote. The village church in Chelmond St. Peter in Buckinghamshire. Not thought of as a high church, puts a paper on the church door, <laughs> where Martin Luther also nailed something on the church door, that says, quote, when you come into this church, remember the Lord Jesus Christ is here, he is present and to be adored under the form of the blessed sacrament reserved for Holy Communion. Kneel down and worship him. This is 100% Roman Catholic Eucharistic doctrine. The blood and flesh of Jesus Christ transformed into the bread and wine of the Eucharist during the Mass. Nothing has that to do with the so-called Holy Communion. When Jesus said, when you break this bread and drink this wine, this do in remembrance of me, that he didn't mean that that bread changes into his body and soul, divinity and flesh, and all humanity and divinity. No, 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 no. That's what the Roman Catholic Church makes out of this. And this church puts a paper on there and says, kneel even down to this bread? Kneel down to this Jesus cookie? Kneel down to the monstrance probably they have also? Where is the Bible? I <laughs> mean, when you as a protest go into that church and you read this paper on the entrance, what, what, what do you do? What do you do when you come to that church and you read when you come into this church, remember the Lord Jesus Christ is here. He is present and to be adored under the form of the blessed sacrament reserved for Holy Communion. Kneel down and worship it. You know what I would do when I would go to the, that church? If I ever would go to a church, whatever, and I read that, I would turn 180 degrees around and run and run as fast and as far as my feet would take me. Because I would sense the devil in that kind of church. How about you? Pulpits are physically disappearing. Stone and other altars reappearing. Crucifixes abound. Roots are returning as are confessions and quote-unquote holy places and more and more ministers are styled as priest and father. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 23 verse 9 And call no man your father upon earth for one is your father which is in heaven. Mariolatry is no longer just the preserve of the high church. Growing devotion to Our Lady in quote-unquote Protestant churches is an important feature of the ecumenical movement. No fewer than 180 Anglican churches have shrines to Our Lady of Walsingham. 
Cathedrals, such as at Carlisle, Chester and Chichester, celebrate that which can be readily interpreted as the sacrifice of the Mass under the auspices of the new Anglican liturgies. Interchurch and interfaith pilgrimages are organized in increasing numbers as devotees search for their pre-Reformation roots. You know, we will not, you will not find your pre-Reformation roots in interchurch and interfaith pilgrimages. Let me tell you that. The New Age movement is of course not left out, and Glastonbury, center of occult and pagan activity, attracts possibly the largest number of pilgrims. The 1988 ecumenical celebration mass for the millennium of the death of Anglican St. Dunstan in Glastonbury attracted a gathering of some 14,000 pilgrims led by the Archbishop of Canterbury. As we have seen, the media today has a crucial role in furthering the Romanizing process of the ecumenical movement. High-profile ecumenical leaders appear regularly in the newspapers and on television. For example, Cardinal Warlock was prominent on the September 1988 BBC program Songs of Praise, which explored the ecumenical dimension of the Walsingham pilgrimage. He, was, he it was who presided over the sacrifice of the Mass at Liverpool Cathedral, which was specially networked to a shaken nation after the Hillsborough football disaster 1989. Warlock and Anglican Bishop David Shepherd often referred affectionately in the press as Tweedledum and Tweedledee, have probably between them achieved more for the ecumenical cause than anyone else in the country. Bishop Shepherd a former England cricket captain and Archbishop Warlock blaze the trail for ecumenical covenants and are joint authors, joint authors of a book <coughs> called Better Together. Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Bishop Shepherd's great predecessors at the Sea of Liverpool, J. C. Ryle, who foresaw the success of Romanizing of the Romanizing process in this century, J. C. Ryle did not think that it is better together. He believed that his bishop's allegiance to the Church of England's Articles of Faith was not negotiable. Bishop Ryle did not make any compromise. The articles of faith of the Church of England are not negotiable. And that's what we true Protestants should do. Not negotiate with the so-called Holy See. Not negotiate with the Antichrist. Not negotiate with the devil, but expose him in every way and shape and form we can ever J. C. Ryle believed that his bishop's allegiance to the Church of England's Articles of Faith was not negotiable. And right he was. And this brings us to the conclusion of chapter 17 called what's it called? The Pace of Ecumenical Progress of All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian. The word of God does not compromise, because the word of God is truth. And it is the only truth that we have in this world. And we should hold on to this truth and not mingle it with lies. Because the moment that we do that, we have sold out. And for what? The only thing that we can do is lose our lives when we do that not gain it. 
We will gain our life by accepting Jesus Christ and His teaching and the truth and the life and the light that He represents. Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins 2,000 years ago and who washed us clean and who imputed us with righteousness if we accept Him as our Savior. Please go to the Joint Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification that I put the links into, into the description box of this video. Please go and watch the Hour of the Truth broadcasts 1, 2 and 3 of the Catholic Lutheran Accord to get a further, deeper understanding of everything that I read in this book and discussed with you in this book reading here. Chapter 17 is done and the next one will be Chapter 18 which is called Peace and Evangelization 2000 and I'm very much looking forward to it because I really learned to love this book with every reading a little bit more and I hope you can agree with me on that 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 is a wonderful book that when read with eyes open tells us where the majority of this world has gone wrong, has gone astray, has been committed, ad uh, has been committing adultery. Instead of clinging on to Jesus Christ, the majority of Protestants committed adultery with the whore of Rome. Thank you very much for watching and listening. Jogler 66 signing off. Until next time, God bless you all and bye bye. We as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take the information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way maybe they have a way to find to the real truth I mean these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called quote-unquote Christian countries of course the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies. 
and love your neighbor. <laughs>